So welcome everybody to our program and today we are very welcome our new guest. It's uh, Dr. Benjamin Talis. Uh, it's the Senior Research Fellow, German Chancellor on Foreign Relations. Hello. Hello. Uh, what a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for your time and uh, I hope that our conversation uh, will be uh, quite interesting for our audience because uh, you collected some interesting thoughts about what's going on with the defense of European Union after one year of war. You gather it in your book and we'll talk about your book and your observation of the situation as well. So my first question will be about the transformation of European Union defense and understanding uh, uh, of uh, its high speed that's transforming during all this year. So what are the main signs that you can say that will have a long-term effect for the European Union or even for the whole region or continent as you see right now? Well, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because it's certainly been a wake-up call for uh, all of the EU member states to, to get serious about security and get serious about defense. Um, but it's also been a, uh, a rude awakening to the fact that the EU is not the institution through which to do that, that NATO is by far the, the better suited institution for questions of hard power, military security, um, and guaranteeing the security of, of Europe. And that's been a very clear message uh, this year. Now, that doesn't mean that the EU has nothing to do in terms of security, but what it does mean is uh, it's essential to get the balance and the division of labor between those two institutions right. And that means now, but it also means in the future when Ukraine is looking to be part of the EU, and I would also suggest should very much be part of NATO as well. In your book, uh, it's called uh, To Ukraine with Love uh, as an essay on Russia's war in Europe and Europe's future, right? You have put uh, together a mosaic of facts that I mentioned right now on the consequences of European policy that changing since the start of war in Ukraine. Um, but uh, throughout this book, uh, I saw even both, I'd say, doubts and skepticism of some politics if not cynicism of uh, some politics in European Union politicians. So why do you think uh, there is still such exception of the situation and reality of the politicians in the European Union? Well, thank, thanks very much for mentioning the book. So people know what it looks like. It's here. This is To Ukraine With Love, Essays on Russia's War and Europe's Future. And that, that gathers to, together uh, a series of different writings around four different themes, which uh, which you, you've introduced nicely. One is about Ukraine's uh, struggles to become part of the European Union. Another is about Central Eastern Europe and the resurgence of the region as a moral actor and the rise of what I call the new idealism or neo-idealism, which I'll come to in a second. Then there's also a lot of essays about Germany and Germany's stuttering transformation, the so-called Zeitenwende or tectonic shift, change of epochs, as it's been known. And then there's others about how we defend liberal democracy and the relation of that to the, to the visa ban. And all of this is looking at the changes that Europe needs to make, how Ukraine has inspired some in Europe to start going about making those changes, how leaders like uh, Kaya Kalas in Estonia, uh, politicians throughout the Baltic states, but also Zana Marin in Finland and uh, people like the Czech foreign minister to Jan Lipowski have really embraced this moment of change and have looked to what is actually a really forward-looking, future-oriented um, way of protecting Europe, but not only allowing Europe's democracies to survive, but also to help them thrive. And that um, means really defending our values uh, and seeing our values as interests. And that's, in a way, what Ukraine has shown to, to Europe and what the approach taken by President Zelensky has really embodied um, is that uh, understanding uh, in a time when I think before many people around Europe had become quite cynical about democracy, quite cynical about liberal values, to see them really threatened at gunpoint and at the um, under the punishing boots of an invading army really showed why they need to be defended. What are What is the price of freedom, actually, and what are the costs that must be borne? And I think that has been a real wake-up call to those politicians and to, to a lot of people around Europe as well. And that's been really encouraging to see, to say, see people stand up and be counted, to try and do more for this. And so I think that's really the change that we have seen. But it's not a complete change. There are others who are still clinging to the past, and I put uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in that, that category, clinging to the, the world of yesterday, as it were, 
um, the old uh, sort of neoliberal globalizing order, the order where you didn't really have to take care of your security and that easy deals could be done with authoritarian regimes like Russia and indeed uh, with, with China. There are others uh, like Emmanuel Macron uh, who still seem uh, to, to cling to this sort of realist great power politics view of the world and being at the top table is the most important thing, the grandeur of all of this rather than actually putting liberal values and uh, democracy first. So it's been welcome to see a bit of a shift from him more recently as well, saying he would support uh, Ukraine all the way to victory, which is something that Schultz has yet to, uh, yet to say. And it's these these conflicts between how Europe approaches Russia's war, how it approaches standing up for democracy and standing up against authoritarian regimes, and how it understands, therefore, this growing systemic competition between democracies and autocracies um, that at the moment, the front line of which really is in, in Ukraine. So that, I think, is why I call the book also Essays on Europe's Future, because it shows the decision, the choice that is there to be made. And it shows the inspiring examples that we have to, uh, to work with, as well as some of the challenges we have to overcome. We will talk about this new young politician. It's a very interesting part of your book, and it's very interesting for me to observe how they accept the reality of new politics uh, in these circumstances. But now I still try to understand uh, through the uh, quotes from your book, is it really the wake-up call for such politicians that you mentioned right now? I will just quote the following text you, you write. It is taken from a popular Twitter that you wrote in, uh, on 14th of July 2022. I will quote, We should not speak of solidarity with Ukraine. It's our fight too. And another quote, We do not provide aid to Ukraine. It is an investment in our security that contributes to defeating Putin, increasing the pressure for changes and um, other uh, situation with de defense in, in, in Europe as well. So there's two questions about this. If it's not for this war, uh, do you think uh, that this status quo may have been continuing still? I mean, this um, policy of the Austrich, not to see what's going on with the Russian Federation, just uh, thinking about uh, material interests. So do you think uh, this is really a wake-up call? Yeah, I really do. And I think it's not only in terms of foreign and security policy and the obvious challenges that have been posed in that regard this year, but also it's been a wake up call, um, a really striking moment to address the shortcomings in our own democracies and in our societies that were were sliding, to be honest, in a fairly visionless way um, in that status quo period you you described. I think there was um, it's commonly known as the interregnum in international affairs that the old order was, was dying, but the new could not yet be born. I think we really are are starting to see the birth of a new a new international order now that's much more clearly de delineated between uh, democracies and autocracies and really reflects that uh, that competitive world. But what we now have an interregnum of is our own socioeconomic situation. Uh, neoliberalism is in effect dead, but a new economic order has yet to be born, and it's. For me, these these challenges are very much connected because, as you rightly say, sticking to the old uh, ostrich model yeah. uh, had implications at home as well as abroad. It had implications for how, for example, Germany was dealing with Russia, but it also had implications for how Germany was failing to invest in its own digitalization, its technological transformation, and had not embraced the changes to the world of work that we will need to actually continue to be competitive, but also the changes to the way we organize our societies in order to share the benefits of freedom and progress with more of our people. And it's that lack of sharing those benefits, plus the lack of, I think, a bigger project to feel part of, that was really part of the ennui and this sort of listlessness that we saw in Western societies that were, to a certain extent, declining. Mm -hmm. In your book, actually, you, you put a lot of uh, your attention uh, to uh, Germany. Uh, among all the countries. And for me, it's uh, interesting how globally, after all this uh, situation with war, may change uh, the influence uh, of Germany in European Union and on the continent and among Western democracies, especially uh, with all these cases uh, with uh, Olaf Scholz, with uh, not given uh, fast uh, the all needed uh, martial equipment, uh, with all the tanks, Leopard, and all the people that were coming to the street and asking for the government to help Ukraine and so on. So we see that uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, 
people, the society, more effective than politicians right now. So will it change the influence of Germany as one of the top countries in the European Union after the war ends with such policy? Yes, very much so. And this has been a key theme of, of my analysis over the last year and of, of my research. I mean, I focus on Germany partly because I'm based here in, in Berlin and I work at the German Council on Foreign Relations, which is one of the leading German think tanks. So a lot of our effort is put into understanding Germany and Germany's role and influence in the world. But I also, even before I started that work, focused on Germany because it's such an important player. And one of the reasons that I think Germany has been under so much pressure is that everybody knows what it would mean to have Germany really really on on the team and really contributing to the full extent of its capability because it has a large population very large economy, very capable industries, including defense industries. Um, and having having a sort of full-throated German commitment to Ukrainian victory would make an enormous difference. Now, we've seen, of course, this year that Germany has provided a lot in absolute terms. It's the second largest contributor in pure financial terms uh, and in the value of equipment donated uh, after the United States. But on a relative to GDP ranking, it's nowhere near the top. And so the Baltic states and others have really surged ahead in that regard. Nor has it been first to provide key equipment at key times. And so, for example, the Czech Republic and Poland blazed the trail last March and April in providing tanks already. And at that time, uh, it was interesting to note that 65% of the German public uh, supported providing German tanks yep. uh, to Ukraine. Now, it took the best part of a year to actually get that decision to be made. And this hesitancy, this moving ever so slowly and having to be pressured at every step by international partners or in the perception of many Ukrainians waiting sadly for yet another massacre to happen so to provide a different scale of equipment. So after Butcher, we saw the provision of artillery. After Mariupol, we see the provision of HIMARS and so on. And this this, this is not a sustainable way of making influence in the world because it looks as, as well as the human tragedy and the cost in lives uh, of Ukrainians that this can be measured in, this delay. What it really looks like is that Germany is taking policy rather than making policy, and it's not shaping it. It's being bounced into this by its partners and by events, and that's not strategic thinking. The other part of this is the way that Germany has handled its relations with allies, uh, and this latest fiasco over the provision of the Leopards and the tanks, uh, even the granting of permission to other countries to provide that, which was really the ultimate no-brainer. Um, this this was handled in such a way that it further uh, damaged the trust that uh, allies have in Germany and further damaged its uh, its influence in those capitals. So I think this is what German politicians are going to find, is that even though they still have a large economy and a large population size, um, they are not going to carry the same weight in allied capitals because of this lack of vision and lack of leadership and the fact they've been seen to be an obstacle. Now, two, two things quickly on that. One is that there may, in German policymaking circles, be seen to be some good reasons for this. There have been fears about being attacked by Russia. There's been fears of nuclear escalation. But of course, Germany does not have the monopoly on nuclear fear. Other countries fear this too. And it's not just how you fear it, it's, it's what you do with that fear and how you handle it. So that's clearly been different for Poles, for Estonians, and for Czechs, for example, than it has for, for the German leader, Olaf Scholz, and his coterie. But it's really right to emphasize what you did before and say that the German people have actually been much more forward-looking, let's say, and much more willing to lean in to support for, for Ukraine. I think the underlying reason, though, for the hesitancy beyond any questions of uh, retaliation or, or escalation is the, the unwillingness to accept the level of change that's actually needed to deal with the changing world. And that change would be accelerated by a decisive Ukrainian victory. And I'm not sure that the current German leadership is willing or able to make that level of change. You are uh, talking about fears, and it was one of the explanation uh, during a long period of time, not only from Germany, but from a lot of countries, why they're not ready to provide all the uh, equipment for us at the time that uh, are very um, important on the battlefield. But on the other hand, uh, we see that the society we're talking about are less afraid of all the words that are pronounced by Putin and not society of European Union and German as well. So it means that the politicians know much more or the politicians more, I'm sorry for this word, are covered in this situation. So why do you think that's, don't we overestimate 
all the Putin's uh, words about escalation, about nuclear weapon and all, because what we see on the battlefield, it's absolute fake. Yes, uh, it's, you're asking a question a lot of people people ask, and I, I would say one thing in defense of the politicians is that it's they have the responsibility to protect their countries and societies in a way that everyday people on the street don't. Those people are part of those societies, but it's not them who would carry the can if this went, went wrong. So I can understand the need to be a little bit more sure. I can understand the need to explore the situation thoroughly. But what I don't understand is exactly what you, what you mentioned, the fact that we've seen that actually Actually, the only thing that really escalates with Russia is cowardice. And the only thing that escalates with Russia is backing down and actually yeah. indulging the whims of the dictator. Every time we've stood up to Putin, he's backed down. And this should have been a lesson we, we learned a long time ago. Um, but I think it was to do with the fact that politicians didn't really, in, in, West, in the West and in, uh, in Western Europe in particular, didn't have a cohesive vision or a convincing vision for their own societies. They didn't trust in our values and they weren't willing to really stand up for them. And so that, therefore, there was not really the kind of pushback against the alternative system presented by the dictators, presented by authoritarian regimes, that there should have been. And there was more of a, a sort of coping mechanism, coping with decline, having a bit of an easier life, and taking the cheap gains of, of trade. And you mentioned before that this was about you know, looking after material interests. Well, yes and no. It's a very short-termist and narrow conception of your interests, as, as we've seen now. Um, that the German government has had to find huge amounts of money to compensate for their lack of previous um, good policy. 200 billion on a totally unstrategic energy cap price support, 100 billion special fund for defense. Goodness knows how much more um, the transition towards um, away from Russian energy has, has cost. So we see there's been a very narrow and short-termist um, understanding of those interests. The, the other part of this is um, something that we mentioned briefly before, is the distinction between those leaders who see this as their own fight and those people who see this as their own fight. And the Czech Prime Minister, Petr Fiala, wrote uh, about this in, in October. Others have been explicit about it too. They see that Ukraine's fight really is, is ours. And this is what you alluded to from that Twitter thread that I mentioned. It's not about us being in solidarity with Ukraine. This is our fight. And it's not about aid. It's an investment in all of our security. And that's something that some countries haven't fully grasped, to be quite honest. Even, I would say, the United States, which has been by far the biggest donor, and without which I think we would see a different um, situation on the battlefield, certainly. But even the United States, I think, has not, and their leaders have not fully grasped the consequences for democracies and for liberal ordering of this fight. I would love to see more countries do that uh, and to really get hold of this and say, yeah, we need to fight as if this were ours as well. Maybe you're very right about these expressions that we already mentioned about uh, we shouldn't speak about solidarity, but uh, about our fight too, and uh, providing not aid, but provided uh, making an investment in our uh, mutual security. So maybe this is very comfortable for some politician to still pronounce in this expression, these words. I mean, to change the narrative completely will uh, give them a chance to change the policy as well. Because uh, it's it's the informational elements and instrument of uh, you know of war as well, and I remember not long ago Ursula von der Leyen, the president of European Commission, was uh, telling her speech for the Parliament that we have been deaf for many years, while the neighboring countries of European Union that are with Ukraine neighboring were shouting out just like we. Uh, to the Western European countries. So pay attention on what's going on with the Russian Federation. Don't build this Northern Stream pipe. Don't do this. Don't do that. Just pay attention that the aggression is at the borders already. So we didn't listen to that. So now we still have uh, uh, these uh, uh, obviously comfortable expressions from the mouths of some politicians. So do you think how many atrocities have to still uh, happen in Ukraine to change these expressions completely, 
to change the narratives from the politicians of Europe? I think you're, you're absolutely right that discourse matters and matters very significantly in this conflict as in, in others. And we, we saw the value of that with, with Ursula von der Leyen uh, on the 27th of February, when in one sentence she upturned two decades of EU policy on, on Ukraine's membership of the EU. So they're one of us, they belong with us. And I mean, this, as, as I've been working on uh, EU-Ukraine relations for nearly 20 years and have been advocating for stronger, closer ties and, and membership for Ukraine for a long time, this was a remarkable uh, turn of events, and it showed what leadership can do and what the right discourse can achieve at the right time when it's deployed there. And so I think you're right that we should be we should be focusing on this. And of course, that's also a role for experts um, uh, to play, and it's one that I try and play. That based on my analysis, based on the the evidence that we um, that we gather, we can make compelling arguments for particular things that we then think are in the interests of our various societies, and we can define that differently. It might be the interest of Ukraine, it might be the interests of Germany, it might be the interests of the European Union or of NATO and the wider democratic world. And based on that, we have to be able to change the, the discourse. And also part of that is about capturing these, these moments in effective narratives. And I think that's indeed why, what I've tried to do with, with the book and also with those Twitter threads is to look at what are effective narratives that show the core the problems that we have to overcome and what are different ways of thinking, talking and acting that can actually overcome those problems and get to a better situation. So I, I firmly see that as part of the job of the expert community. Um, and we've particularly also seen how expert discourse plus also political leadership can influence public opinion. In Germany, the case of the tanks was very, very indicative in this regard, because after the early support for this, then the political leadership started to talk against sending tanks, talking against this as an escalatory measure, and the support went down. Now we can see the German public once again firmly behind uh, sending tanks as the case for this was publicly made. So we all have a responsibility to, uh, to participate in that. It's truly awful, though, that you, you put it very well um, when saying how many more massacres will need to happen before this real change happens. I think it's, it's tragic that almost a year now into this latest phase of this war, which as we know has been going on for a lot longer, it's, we, we're still thinking in those ways and there are still some who have to be persuaded of this. And that's what I don't think politicians in the West have yet done quite a good enough job of is to show their populations what really are the costs of losing your freedom? What are the costs that are imposed by a dictatorial regime? Why should we really stand up against this kind of aggression on principle and in practice? And how do we actually go about securing our futures by doing so? And that's what I'd love to see them doing more of, because I think the logical consequence of that is not only immediately more support for Ukraine, but it's also a reinvestment in our own futures in a way that actually gives a sustainable alternative to authoritarian regimes in the longer run. Let's talk about very interesting item, the changes of generations of politicians. Let's talk about young and ambitious and uh, politicians that are not afraid uh, to uh, say very, uh, let's say, rude uh, uh, statements uh, towards Russia, towards Putin, and uh, the politicians that uh, are not looking at the world, the modern world through, world through the prisma of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Cold War, so they're not from that period of time from that era. So they have new view on the reality. They grew up uh, in the situation of uh, technology development uh, very fast. So they have other priorities. Such uh, persons like, uh, for as you mentioned, Sanna Marin, uh, that is not, she's not afraid to say uh, who is aggressor and what to do with aggressor. Because even though her country is very small and under the eye of Putin uh, during all this year. So anyways, do you think that uh, we have to wait uh, for the complete change of politician generation and then we'll see the new era of uh, diplomacy, of connection between countries, of the interests that might connect people, politicians and other, as I say, economical sector and others, but not just the private interests among the old establishments that bring, brought actually to the war, more or less. Yeah, I mean, Zana Marin was fantastic when saying, you know, the way out of the war, the way out of the war is for Russia to get out of Ukraine. Absolutely. And that was 
calling uh, calling it exactly like it is. And I think people have really appreciated that kind of plain talking, which is backed up by principle and really puts values at the heart of um, of foreign and security policy, while recognizing that those values are actually our interests. And Zana Marin has done that. Also, Kaya Kalas has been able to do that. Uh, Gabriela Landsberg is the foreign minister of uh, Lithuania, has been very strong on talking about these things. And also Jan Lipavsky and uh, from the Czech Republic, as well as, of course, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. Now, they're all yep. roughly comparable age. The, so uh, Lipavsky is slightly younger, but nonetheless um, still towards this sort of e older end of the millennial generation. The others are, like me, actually, Zennials or uh, the sort of younger end of Generation X. And what I've identified that they might have in common is that experience of growing up in the hopeful atmosphere of the 1990s, when it seemed as though anything was possible. That didn't mean it all happened and it all panned out for the best. We know that not everything that could have been achieved was, but nonetheless, there was a feeling at that time for anyone who grew up around Europe, I think, in the aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the communist regimes, and the possibility that things could get better, that had a lasting effect on our generation. And we, I think that hope was betrayed uh, by the subsequent, uh, the war on terror, the misadventures and terrible blunders in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the global financial crisis and the playing out of a, a very, I think, detrimental form of neoliberal economics that robbed a lot of people of their futures. So our hope of the 90s was really betrayed in that way, but has been brought back uh, by these politicians saying, actually, this is what we need to do. We need to re-engineer and reinvigorate this hope and make it believable, touchable, tangible for a new generation. But at the same time, there are also older politicians who get this too. So I don't think it's a strict uh, deterministic thing from generations. So um, Artis Pabrix in the Baltics, the, the Deputy Prime Minister of uh, Latvia, has been very strong on this. Maria Agnes Strack zimmermann in Germany, the chair of the Defence Committee, of the Bundestag, extremely strong on this as well. Um, politicians like Norbert Röttgen and Roderick Kiesewetter uh, here in Germany, very strong also. Boris Johnson, strong on this, less, less so on other things. Um, but they've been clear about that as well. So I think actually the generational thing, while it might be a factor, is not the only factor. The crucial thing is a political realization about the costs of freedom and about the price of, of democracy and why it's worth paying. You mentioned uh, in your book the new uh, term that you see as a new approach of, to geopolitics, as a neo-idealism. What is this? Yeah. It's the new philosophy or it's a real <laughs> instrument that can change uh, the attitude towards making policy in the world? I, of course, I'm going to say it's both. It has a deep uh, philosophical quality to it, but at the same time, it can be a practical guide for policy. And let me explain a little bit okay. why. So on the more, the deeper level, what it tries to do is to um, revive uh, the notion that values are extremely important to, to geopolitics and to saying, actually, if we conceive of our values as ideals to strive for, so even if we're not there yet, there are things we should be constantly working towards and that we should be doing that in a way that we treat these values as our interests to pursue. That is in our interest to pursue democracy, to pursue human rights, fundamental freedoms, but also crucially this hope of a brighter future and to restore this sense of progress, which I think has been missing from uh, the liberalism of the last, uh, last 20 years or so, particularly the last 15, because without that hope of progress, I mean, li liberalism is literally hopeless and that doesn't lead you to anything, anything good, I think. So that would imply, if we take that approach, it means uh, respecting the sovereignty and self-determination of, of all democratic states, including smaller states. So this rejects the sort of great power politics vision of the world that people like John Mearsheimer and other so-called realists um, impose upon the world, which is really what led to, um, led to indulging Russia and undervaluing Ukraine's sovereignty in, in the first place. So it strikes back very clearly at that. It tries to move beyond the kind of liberal internationalism we've had for the last few years, um, because it also sees that you know, international institutions, which are a crucial part of that liberal internationalism, we should really see them as means rather than ends in themselves. And we've seen how the UN and other organizations can be instrumentalized by dictatorships like Russia uh, for their own purpose, and they end up serving illiberal means. So I don't think these new neo-idealist leaders see it in that way. 
But what does it mean in terms of then a guide for, for policy? It means that um, Ukraine, for example, should be free to, to apply to join any international organization it wants. Talking about the threats, you mentioned the uh, democratic values and uh, actually the possible aggression uh, from the Russian Federation. And you remind in your book uh, the words of um, Joseph Barrell that uh, was, he was saying about uh, a new world of threats and he was saying about the Europe that is in danger. So what kind of danger or what threats do you see except for these two main options right now? Why uh, Europe should gather herself together and find the way for new uh, instruments of the defense? And I'm not talking just the factual instruments of defense like the against tanks or, uh, I don't know, uh, bomb shelling or whatever. I mean, uh, Globally, it's an economy, it's, uh, I don't know, cultural uh, defense, uh, uh, the defense of values and so on. So what threatens to Europe? Yeah, it, it's a very good question. And I actually um, criticize Borrell for the way that that um, statement was made. Uh, and why, why do I do that? Because I think that the way that Borrell would seek to address those threats is not a way um, that would actually help Europe. So. Let me say a little bit about why that is. Um, in the document where that, that statement was made, uh, the strategic compass, which is the EU's political military strategy, the latest one, which ended up being a really messy compromise between the different threat perceptions of different countries. So the countries mainly um, on the, the eastern flank or in Central and Eastern Europe saw Russia as a clear threat. Countries to the south didn't share that threat perception so much and were mainly focused looking at the south. And we saw this, this real ineffective compromise that was made, but in order to boost the EU's military capabilities by actually very little. And if you look at what that document asks for, um, I think I'd describe it as taking a discursive sledgehammer to crack a very small capability nut. Um, and it's, it doesn't help. Why? Because in the European Union's best moments, what it's actually seen is a world of opportunities, not a world of threats. It should have left dealing with the threats militarily to NATO, as in the past. And by seeing opportunities, for example, had it seen opportunity earlier in Ukraine and integrated Ukraine more quickly and fully, we wouldn't be facing this situation now, I think. But the EU got scared and got scared of threats coming from, from Ukraine, imagined threats a lot of the time, uh, which I write about in my in my next book. Um, and it, so it lost its point of difference in international affairs, its way of transforming threats into opportunities that really characterized its own development. But in terms of what threats the EU does face, um, I think this closing off of itself to the world is actually a self-created threat that probably threatens it more than any other. The the EU will not be able to defend its values if it takes the kind of approach that Borrell has advocated of seeing uh, the EU as a garden, a civilized place, and the rest of the world as a jungle, an uncivilized place. Now, not only does this really have all sorts of unpleasant echoes of colonial type thinking and colonial uh, and imperial language, it will make it more difficult for the EU to have effective relations with other democracies in the world. Don't forget, of course, that until recently, Ukraine would have been considered part of that jungle. And that's that's a really sad thing to uh, to think about. Now, of course, thankfully, that's not the case, but think how it feels for, for others involved in that. In terms of culture and society and so on, I think the, uh, the EU has moved to do things like to create a commissioner for protecting the European way of life. Um, and I think this is also quite a dangerous way of approaching what might be seen as threats in the world because it puts too much of a fixity and too much of an essentialized um, understanding of and an exclusive understanding as well of what European life is and who are Europeans and what Europeans do. I specifically never talk about European values because I think these are universal values that actually might be expressed by some in Europe. They're expressed also by others elsewhere. And I don't think calling them European values helps either Europeans or, or anyone else. So I think actually the real way that the EU could defend itself is first of all, yes, invest in its military and invest in the kind of security that NATO can provide. But secondly, by actually really reviving the hope of progress uh, through economic integration, through innovation, through cooperation between peoples within the EU, but also with other dem democracies outside that would revive this hope of progress, that would give people a reason to buy into their societies and to commit in their own ways to securing our democracies.
about our future in the European Union, I, I will uh, ask you some additional question. But now, just uh, want to end up with the factual security and talking about uh, the NATO forces and the abilities to protect themselves uh, for the European countries. We know that there is no European army. So there's no such a word as a European army. And I remember even uh, the Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, was trying to create such European army, but still it's like an option. The army that will maybe help NATO forces or will be parallel to NATO forces, I don't know. Do you see the role of European army? Is it uh, necessary to create right now? Do you really have 100% in the Article 5 of NATO to protect countries in the case of open aggression, let's say from Russian Federation as well? Yeah, great, great questions and very important to, to address. Um, in terms of a European army, it's normally talked about in rather than NATO as being an EU endeavor. And it's one that the Central East European member states have never been keen on uh, for reasons that have become clear also this year, is that they don't think they can rely on the protection of the Western European states. Um, because in main part, those states don't have the military capabilities to defend themselves, let alone to defend other states as well. Where there are capabilities uh, is in NATO. And so I think what I've been strongly in favor of is strengthening the European pillar of NATO and for Europeans doing more to ensure their own hard security as part of that European pillar of NATO, which would help to relieve the burden on the United States for upholding Article 5, which I have complete faith in Article Article 5. I think Article 5 of NATO would work if it was required to, would deliver what it's supposed to, and that's why it's a very effective deterrent, uh, because I think that the Russian Federation believes that as well. Their leadership believes that uh, too. Hence, we haven't seen any aggression against NATO states from the Russian Federation. We've seen hybrid active measures, um, destabilization or so on, but nothing that would trigger a military response because they know it would come and they know it would be devastating for them. So I think we should really put our faith in NATO's Article 5, but do more uh, to actually boost our capabilities so that the US can, for example, do more to deal with China. And that's the, China is also a global problem in this regard, or a problem for democracies around the world that we have to uh, defend and deter um, against against. But that's a job that's perhaps more suited to the US in large part. And if we are hold, uphold our end of the bargain in Europe by doing more to provide for our own security, that then is a better contribution to global democratic ordering or to regional democratic ordering. Now, the last thing on that is the EU does have a role to play in this because EU where its strengths lie are in economic uh, cooperation, industrial coordination, perhaps. And the European Defence Agency is starting to do a very good job in this regard as well. So actually, the EU could play a very complementary role in helping to deliver the capabilities that NATO needs to, um, that European states need to bolster NATO. Mm -hmm. So, And I think the, the differences that have been raised in the past about potentially differing goals or so on are not seen to be so much of a problem now. Where the problem arises, if it does, is if the US goes off on a radically different track. But I do find this, this discussion quite facile at times because uh, the US has guaranteed European security for more than 70 years. They had one presidency where this seemed to be quite claimed to be under threat for four years. And then the US is seen as the problem in European security. I mean, I think that's a, a rather far-fetched interpretation that Europeans should look more to themselves at, actually. And uh, maybe the final question is about our future, the future of Ukraine and the European Union. How do you see it, the, the, our role in the European Union? I will give you some details why this question is the last one and why it's so interesting for us. Because during this war, we have uh, a lot of refugees in Europe. And uh, as you may uh, understood as well that uh, Ukrainians had a chance to travel a lot uh, during last five years after giving us the green lights for traveling to Europe and still Ukrainians are um, quite um, people that are interested to open the new horizons and to see other countries. They are quite open people in society. So we traveled a lot and now we are like refugees that are different story from uh, what we can experience while just traveling, uh, like visiting shortly countries. 
country. And we open ourselves uh, the tough uh, um, situations with some matters in Europe as well that is even better in Ukraine. For example, some things in medical uh, service, some things in the other uh, social life uh, that we are got used to and quite difficult because uh, there are a lot of bureaucracy in, in the European uh, countries. And, and uh, I will not detail, detail, detailize, but maybe later, but our people who are refugees right now, they see this because they didn't see it while they were traveling. And so my question is, okay, you are talking about reforms that we have to make, but still Ukraine have a lot of positive experience that can be taken by European countries as well. Okay, we will make our legal reform. And no doubts. Now it's no doubts. So what European Union can take from Ukraine? And what real place you see for Ukraine with all our perspective ideas that we implemented here in Ukraine in Europe? Not just the country of who all everybody will, uh, all, all the countries of European Union will help, but the country that can bring something to European Union as well. Yeah, it's such an important point. I mean, to put it straight and clear for up front, Ukraine has uncancelled Europe's future. That is how I see this, as strongly as that, is that Ukraine has shown us how we can have a future in Europe. Instead of sliding into our own decline, we can actually re revivify this fight for uh, for our ideals. And that's that's why I wrote the new idealism piece. That's why it is inspired by Ukraine and by those um, leaders and societies that have embraced um, Ukraine in that regard. And I mean, you, you don't have to talk about over bureaucratization. I'm sitting in Berlin. I know yeah. what, what you might be referring to. Um, Yes, uh, Ukrainian digital governance, DIA, and things related to that would be a wonderful thing to embrace in Germany. Um, the use of fax machines in the Ukrainian government may have ceased long before other parts of uh, the EU. Um, and I think you know, this, this has been a re revealing time for a lot of people this year. And we've seen in relation to Ukraine's uh, EU aspirations, a lot of the same old hierarchical tropes uh, of the superior West and the inferior East, the Europe that knows and the Europe that waits to be known, that has been intra-European Orientalism and discrimination for hundreds of years since Voltaire. Voltaire talked about this uh, famously years ago. And it's something that the Central East European states are extremely familiar with, um, with dealing with. As they've been able to move, the people from Central Eastern Europe have been able to move around the EU to integrate with others. Um, it's been a success to a significant degree of the EU's model about taking this danger out of difference and showing that Czechs, Poles, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians and others have a lot in common with Germans, French, Italians, um, Dutch and so on and so forth. And that's what I would hope would happen with Ukrainians as well, given time. And that's also why I was so proud to advise on the visa liberalization process um, a few few years ago and to help bring it forward to uh, to fruition. But you, the EU has an awful lot to learn from, uh, from Ukraine in terms of saying, yes, we can. And in terms of saying, yes, we should. Yes, we can have a future. Yes, we should defend our democracy, defend our values and stand up for what's actually right in the world. And I think that's been inspiring on a personal level to so many Europeans that they're looking at again at their own societies and their own governments and saying, we need to fix our roofs too. We need to fix the problems here. I mean, I dread to think if what had happened, the corruption scandals in Austria, for example, mm -hmm. or the when the government in the Netherlands had to resign for structural racism, institutional racism, and then two months later, the same people emerge as the government again. Had this happened in Central Eastern Europe, had this happened in Ukraine, the media reports on this would have been terrible, I'm quite sure. So this it's been a wake up call in that way to Europe as well, I think, to say, look at look at our own situation. We need to do better. Yeah. We need to do better for ourselves and stop looking down on others. That's not going to come easy to some people. And maintaining that sense of moral superiority is still very key to a lot of people in Western Europe in particular. Um, but it has to go if we're going to have a, a better future. And Ukrainians are showing us uh, that every day. So I would love to see a strong Ukraine at the heart of a strong European Union that actually has that desire and forward-looking leadership um, that we've seen coming from Central Eastern Europe and coming from Ukraine in the last year. That will also be a test because some of those countries are smaller countries. They don't have the economic weight. Ukraine would be a poorer country in the EU, but it has the moral clout now, as do the Central East European states. The question is, can, can Western Europeans deal with Central and East European leadership of the EU? It's just the beginning, but first of all, we have to win this war together.
Right. That's right. Okay. Fully agree. Thank you very much for this interview, Benjamin. It was very interesting to talk to you, and I hope that we'll have a chance to do it again when you will present your new book in the nearest future. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind of you. I really enjoyed the conversation and looking forward to the next time. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Okay.